Testing, testing one, two, testing, testing for video.
Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, we'll get started. We want to stay on time. We want to make sure that we get as much uh, discussed and covered uh, in the hour that we have. It's great to see this wonderful turnout. And uh, uh, we'll have uh, some, a couple presentations and then we'll move forward. I've got uh, some folks I'd like to introduce here quickly. Um, the list keeps growing, so bear with me for just a minute. On the front, uh, on the stage here with me, we have Representative Bud Nor Nornis, who is the chair of the Higher Education Committee, if you just hold your applause. Next to him on his left, uh, Vice Chancellor of Finance, Laura King from Minskew. And on the other side of Bud, uh, Dr. Toya Younger, Associate uh, Chancellor for Student Affairs from Minskew. Uh, so let's give them a round of applause and welcome. <clears throat> And we have a number of folks in the audience that I would like to recognize. First of all, Representative Josh Heinzman uh, and his wife, Carrie, down in the front. If you want to hold your applause right behind, maybe you can just stand up so we can see you, uh, Josh and Carrie. Next, uh, uh, Representative Dale Lewick can just stand, uh, if you would. Uh, Mayor Olson from Baxter, back in the heckling section. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Wally, next to him from Brainerd, we're great to, uh, glad to have you here. George Weber down in front, uh, superintendent of schools at uh, Piers. And let's see, who else do I need to recognize here? Sally Eney, uh, former president, is right down in the front here. I'd like to recognize her. Uh, Tom uh, Whiteside, uh, uh, legislative assistant to the US uh, Congressman uh, Rick Nolan is here. Uh, Tim Houle, I think, may be joining us if he's not already from uh, uh, the uh, Crow Wing County. And um, I believe that is it, so let's give these folks a round of applause. <clears throat> uh, this is the Rosenmeyer Forum, and I'm going to say just two a, a minute uh, something, and then I'll, I'll sit down. Uh, Senator Rosenmeyer was from Little Falls, and he was a very instrumental, influential uh, a senator for many years, 30 years, and uh, we are fortunate here to have the Rosenmeyer Center and Rosenmeyer Board that brings events uh, to campus here. It's an independent board from the college, or kind of independent, and they do a wonderful job of uh, putting together public uh, pro um, programs like this around public affairs. Uh, senator Rosenmeyer um, was in the legislature for 30 years and probably was the um, head above shoulders uh, legislator of all time. And uh, you know, we talk about divided government today and concerns we have. Uh, back in the early 60s, I can remember, we went for several months because we didn't know who the governor of the state was. It was between Governor Anderson and, and uh, the new governor, Governor Rolvog. They had to do the count and recount. Um, but behind the scenes, you had folks like Senator Rosenmeyer who <clears throat> was making things happen. And he brought progressive things uh, uh, as a rural legislator uh, to this state. So we really uh, have a legacy here, and it's great that we can be a small part of it. At this point, I'd like to bring uh, Steve Wenzel up. Uh, Steve is on uh, the faculty, as many of you know. And uh, Steve has uh, been behind this. If Steve, you want to come up uh, as the executive director, he's put many, many hours into pulling this together, but he does this every time. So uh, let's give Steve a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Lundblad, for those kind words. Our first speaker today is Representative Bud Nornis of Fergus Falls, in Ottertail County. Representative Nornis brings almost a lifetime of devoted service to education and to public service. He was elected to the Fergus Falls School Board in 1982 and served until 1996 when he won election to the Minnesota House of Representatives. Representative Nornis is serving his 10th term in the Minnesota House of Representatives. It was my privilege to have served six years in the Minnesota House with Representative Nornis as a colleague and a friend. I knew Bud Nornis to be a legislator who was devoted to the people of his district and a person of great personal integrity. As a legislator, Representative Nornis was a close friend of Fergus Falls Community College. In January of this year, the Speaker of the House appointed Representative Nornis to be the chair of the House Committee on Higher Education Finance. 
that is the key committee for higher education in the state of Minnesota. I said at the time that Representative Nornis was the right person at the right time to be named the chair of this key committee that will decide the financial future of Minnesota's state colleges and universities. Representative Nornis indeed can be called, in my opinion, the man of the hour. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce Representative Nornis to you, the chair of the Higher Education Finance Committee for the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, got here a little early, and thanks to uh, President Larry and uh, Steve and others, got a nice tour of the campus. And I, I was my first time here, and I'm very impressed with uh, the facility and the programs that are offered here. Uh, so it's an honor to be here, a part of this forum. I, I had a chance to read a little bit about uh, Senator Rosenmeyer myself, and uh, a couple of things that are interesting, I guess, to point out that he ran during a time when we didn't have any party designations. And then in the early 70s, that changed. And one other change that happened was that we also had sessions every year. During his time, they were, they were just every other year. So a lot of things changed, and you could argue whether any of it's an improvement. But uh, anyway, I... Uh, I am chair of the Higher Education Committee, and I have to, uh, I guess, tell you honestly, uh, that doesn't mean I am the most knowledgeable person in the legislature or anywhere. But I'm a chair, and my job is to basically make decisions and help with the committee members, again, make decisions. And that also includes the folks at Minsku, the university, higher education, and the public. So that's how I see my role as someone that can uh, here, and then from that, hopefully, uh, lead the committee to a good uh, piece of legislation that will actually, uh, for the next two years, be beneficial. You know, I grew up at a time when I think everything was a little simpler. My wife and I both graduated in 1961, which for some of you seems like really the old days, <laughs> just seems like yesterday. But you could go to college pretty e economically, uh, I worked on a farm for the Swenson brothers, earning $200 a month. And at the end of two summers, I had enough money to pay my tuition. So when I went to school, it was all paid for. And uh, today, it's not as easy to do that. Uh, it was also a time when, if you're deciding what college to go to or what course you wanted, uh, you wanted to be a teacher, probably. A lot of my classmates were teachers or farmers. Uh, my wife was a beautician, uh, one of the few, I think, that chose that profession. Uh, came in handy now because she gives me haircuts. <laughs> I, I get free haircuts. You know, so it's, it's a different time. Students are looking at a lot of different challenges, and one of the big ones is, is the debt uh, that they, in, that they occur, incur while they're in school. And uh, we've had some pretty startling testimony in the committee recently. Uh, believe it or not, one student claimed to be in debt, or will be, $400,000. Uh, and, and that, you, you can't understand, that's not even possible. But in, in her case, it, it apparently is. So that's an exception. But even without, uh, uh, you know, being that extreme, uh, it's easy to have uh, a debt probably approaching, uh, approaching 30000 for an average student. Um, the legislature has tried, <clears throat> or at least had a goal, that we're in partnership with the students and the state picking up the bigger share of that cost. Uh, that's the way it was back in, um, but what year was that? I've got it here, 19, or 2002, I think, is the, the latest chart that I saw where uh, the difference was 66.3% paid by the state and 33.7% paid by the student. Uh, that's currently, uh, the figures I have, 56% now by the state and 43.9% uh, by the student. Um, and the goal, I guess, is to be at 50-50 if we can get there. And, and that's not really a big deal when you look at what we were doing in, in 2002. But to, to, get any, to get beyond the 50-50, 
uh, is, is, is very difficult. At the same time, you know, challenges for enrollments. The state grant program has been a real lifesaver, I think, for students. And even when we had difficult budget times, and I should add that I've been chair of this committee on now three different occasions. And the first two, you know, I was a little naive the first time Steve Swigum called and said, would you like to be chair of the Higher Education Committee? And I, I said, who, me? But, but you can't say no to Steve. All Steves are probably the same. You just can't say no to them. <laughs> but Steve, so I accepted it without realizing, boy, I don't have a very good budget. In fact, it's a very bad budget. But we, we, we went through that. And I should add that uh, your past president, President Opatz, was my vice chair that year. So we had a Democrat for a vice chair and a Republican for a chair. And it was a very good combination. And we survived. The second time around, same thing. I get the lousiest budget. You know, where you're cutting instead of adding. So this year, we're optimistic, a little bit optimistic, that we will be able to put together a bill that is satisfactory and has some increases in it. That, that is the challenge right now, because there's a huge difference between what the governor is offering, what I have as a, a budget that's been presented to me, and then what the Senate is, is doing. Um, Minsku is right now where our our heart is and where our funding is designated because that's really all we have to work with. Um, with what we have, we can do a reasonably good job for Minsku, but it leaves absolutely nothing now for the university. So that'll be the challenge when we get back, is how we work this out. We don't want to necessarily do harm to the university, but it's a different situation than Minsku. Uh, it's much bigger, uh, and they would survive, I guess, if we just let uh, the current situation continue for another two years. But our intent is to try to do all we can for, for both systems, as well as the state grant program. We have frozen tuition the last two years for both. The plan is to do the same. I told President Kaler, I was over at a reception, and I said, uh, that was nice. But you know what we did? We, we froze tuition too high. It would have been nicer if we could have lowered tuition and then froze it. But uh, that didn't work. We are hopeful, and just a little hopeful, that in the House Higher Education Bill, uh, with what we have to work with, we are hoping we can design a way that in the second year, it hasn't been fully determined yet, but we'd like to see a, just a little lowering of the tuition for the technical student, students, uh, if, if we can do that much. So we're hopeful we can, uh, by the end of May, the 18th of May, that we'll have something similar to that uh, to, uh, to conclude the session. In the meantime, you know, the cost of education, cost of college isn't really going to go down. I think that's pretty obvious. So my advice to maybe not this group, because you're already here or have been here, but for the students that are in high school, you know, I think students need to prepare a little better for the higher education experience in a lot of different ways, but one of them is the financial part. So in any way you can, earn a little money, save a little money. I know it's tempting to have the iPads and the iPhones and all of the other stuff to go with it, and games, but they're expensive. But I, you know, I'm just advising it's, it should not be the first day of, of college where you go and borrow as much money as you can. That's where the $30,000 debt comes in. So, you know, if, if you were my son, daughter, grandchildren, that would be my advice. Just be prepared for college because it's not going to be an inexpensive thing. The other thing is, now I can't tell you how to do this exactly, but if, if you can kind of determine a path that you want to go on so when you're investing the money that it's invested well and that your courses can be transferred and all of the things kind of sync together, that's the ultimate outcome too. So kind of prepare a goal. And I tell you, those goals are never exactly 100%. And I may be out of time. Close? Yesterday, my wife and I attended a funeral. Her uncle had passed away. He was 93 years old. Now, this is a long time ago now when he was in college. He was going to be a minister. Uh, he was selling light fixtures in the Twin Cities. Went to some kind of a missionary outreach program of some kind where he met his wife. And so he gave up the selling of the light fixtures. 
and gave up the ministry and bought a dairy farm. So in a very short length of time, he had changed three careers, light fixtures, ministry, and then wound up a lifelong dairy farmer. So these goals have to be flexible, and you'd be surprised sometimes uh, where it takes you. One more personal story, our granddaughter went to uh, UMD, and uh, one year basically at Fergus Falls M State uh, online. She gets married over there, and uh, her husband is in law enforcement. And he's gonna be, uh, uh, he kind of gave up on the law enforcement, he wanted to be a parole officer. So he'd already changed while he was still in school, but it's still the same general area. So now he's graduating, but now what do you do? He kind of lost interest in law enforcement. But a friend of his was working for the railroad. So as we speak here today, he's driving a train. <laughs> he's the engineer of a train. Now, I wouldn't trust him with my car. <laughs> I mean, he's a nice guy, but he's a, he's a, he's a little, um, how would you say it? Um, I don't know how to say it. He, he, he likes excitement and, and fun things. And, and my car would not, I've got a BMW, and he would not, the car would love it maybe, and he would love it, but I'd be very nervous about it. So, so, so he's, he, he enjoys what he wound up doing. The education is not something that he wasted. Uh, it's just all part of, you know, getting a piece of life and settling down, but now expecting their first child. So I guess that's the end of my advice. Uh, I would like to hear from anyone that has input, from students or parents. Uh, you know, we, um, we, we're really lucky in Minnesota with what we have for students. I mean, there are so many options, some of it very close to home. Um, I can't think of a single reason, you know, to leave the state to get an education. Some do, but um, we have a lot to offer here, and uh, I'm very proud of everybody that's involved in, in the teaching field profession, and, and uh, I could talk about, um, you know, there's a lot of jobs and nobody to fill them. That's a, a whole different day, I guess. We can talk about that some other time. But uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here. And thanks to Steve and everybody that organized this. Uh, it's been a good experience. First time I've been here. Uh, very impressed with what you have. And if you have any wants here at the college, uh, just call me. Okay? <laughs>
Um, Toya Younger, who's here on the program with me, um, we were laughing this morning as we arrived because we'll go anywhere, we'll go talk to anybody that, talks, that wants to talk about higher education. We're passionate about it, we're passionate about this work, uh, and so we're delighted to be included here today. Um, what you'll hear from us today really is sort of a tale of two cities. On the one hand, uh, Minnesota's really at a crossroads when it comes to higher education. Um, there's some very important decisions ahead of us, uh, decisions ahead for all of our citizens about how we want to move into the next, into the next decades. Uh, but you'll also hear that there's just fabulous things going on at our colleges and universities. So it's a, it's a good news, good news story, uh, but it has a couple of, um, a couple of bumps uh, ahead of us. Representative Nornis has been a great friend to the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities and to this region, and I thank you for that, and I, and I urge you not to ask me what to tell your engineer son-in-law because I don't have the answer, but I'm delighted that you were able to be here today uh, and to have your wife join you. Um, there's a lot about public higher education that, um, that I want to try to walk through quickly here, uh, and so I'll be going a little fast, but I know we've got time for question and answers at the end. Uh, and so um, we'll be sure and save that time. Let me figure out the technology here. Push the button. OK. Um, what, what Steve asked me to talk about today was the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities particularly. Um, you heard Representative Nornis talk about the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. And there's just a tremendous system of private colleges in Minnesota. Um, I won't be talking about them today. I'll be talking about the colleges and universities um, that are part of our system. Central Lakes is one of those. Uh, and it's, the, it's the, 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 um, the group that we care the most about, certainly. Central Lakes is one of 24 colleges uh, that are in the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities system, um, along with seven state universities. Uh, we serve 410,000 students a year, uh, making us about the fourth largest system in the country. It's about two-thirds uh, for credit instruction and one-third not for credit instruction. So the um, customized training programs or the business industry programs that you have uh, at Central Lakes and across the state. Um, we are, as you can see from this map, located all over Minnesota. There is just a incredible infrastructure of public assets all over Minnesota that were built by the taxpayers of Minnesota with leadership from the legislature to provide access to higher education, whether you're in International Falls or Marshall. Um, I commented to someone just yesterday, it's 800 miles from our northernmost campus to our southernmost campus. We used to have a president um, who liked to say that his collection of colleges that he had leadership for covered a geographic area that would consume 11 East Coast states. That's how big Minnesota is, uh, and that's how big some of, our, some of our distances are from one campus to the next. Not only do we have a lot of real estate, we serve a lot of students. Uh, our system educates 58% of the undergraduates in Minnesota. You can see here shown in the blue, um, in the blue pie chart. Um, that's nearly six out of 10. Um, all of the students here at Central Lakes add up the other 31 colleges and universities and you have 400, you have 58% of the undergraduates uh, receiving um, public or private uh, edu higher education in Minnesota are enrolled at one of the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. And it's a very diverse student body. Uh, and becoming more diverse, which is part of the, part of the tale of, um, that we have for you today. 52,000 first generation students, and by that we mean students who um, are the children of parents who have not completed college. Um, they might have enrolled in college but not completed, so they themselves are the first generation in their family to attend college. We also serve 62,000 American Indian and, students of, and other students of color. Um, we're the largest provider of higher education to veterans in Minnesota, uh, and um, a substantial portion of our student body uh, is um, Pell eligible, um, able to access federal financial aid. It's important to note at the bottom of this, we are the um, largest provider in all of these categories uh, across Minnesota. 
One of the things that's um, happening in Minnesota and happening in our colleges and universities is that the students are changing. Um, and you can see from this chart, um, students of color and American Indian students have become an increasing portion of our enrollment, an even more increasing portion in the years to come. From in 2005, uh, in the colleges, uh, they represented 16% of enrollment. Uh, by 2011, that number had almost doubled to 27%. Uh, at the system level, it's an increase from 14 to 23%. Minnesota is changing. The face of Minnesota is changing, and it doesn't matter if you're in Minneapolis or Wilmer. And that's showing up in our enrollment, and it's showing up in um, the programs and services that we provide. The other thing that's changing for Minnesota, and Representative Norn has made reference to this, um, is students are significantly more low income. Um, what this chart shows you that uh, is as a result of the Great Recession, more and more of our students come from families with very modest means. There's been a dramatic growth in both the number and percent of students who are eligible for participation in the federal financial aid program. Uh, during the last 10 years, we've seen a 75% increase, um, I had to read the word click to remember to click. Um, we've seen a 75% increase from 2008 to 2011. Uh, the colleges and universities increased uh, from 23% to 37% in Pell eligible, and all of our credit enrollment growth system-wide between 2005 and 2014 came, um, can be attributed to students that came uh, to us in a Pell eligible category. All of our enrollment growth came from our, low, our lowest income students. That's partly why Representative Nornis is so interested in affordability and what's going on with students' ability to pay. Um, it's showing up um, in our classrooms and our hallways. And it's really one of just a, several large changes that are happening in Minnesota. Um, let me talk a little bit about demographic changes. Uh, and then um, I'll pass you to Toya, and she'll talk about student service changes and uh, changes in response to this. Um, first of all, the baby boom is retiring. Um, if we think about the people around us, um, I'm sure that you have folks around you that are getting close to retirement. Uh, we are a very large segment of the population, and we're all moving into retirement at the same rate. Um, high school graduation rates have, are dipping. Um, fewer, fewer zero to 18 year olds are coming up through the pipeline. Um, we're seeing a very strong population shift uh, and growing diversity. The population shift particularly is of note because there's something happening in this region um, that's a little counter trend, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Generally, um, the population in Minnesota is moving from the western border into the center of the state. Uh, and the, there's a population crescent happening from St. Cloud, or Brainerd, down to St. Cloud, through the cities, and down to Rochester. That, that crescent is showing population growth. Every other part of the state is showing population decline. Um, and that has really big implications for higher education in Minnesota and for the colleges and universities that we have serving outstate growth. Um, all of the net population growth in Minnesota in the next 20 years um, will be in the, the what we call the new citizen category. It's either um, international immigrants or immigrants into the region from other parts of the country. Um, and 70% of it will occur in students of color um, or, or American Indian. Um, that's where the growth is happening in Minnesota. That's where the growth is happening in the labor force. Uh, and that's where the growth is happening in our enrollment. Um, Think about, think about that while you think about what's going on with the workforce. Baby boom retirement rates are driving um, vac job vacancy rates up. Dip in high school graduation rates um, are not feeding the labor force as fast as the retirements are happening at the other end. A population shift um, away from the western part of the state towards the center uh, and a much more diverse population. At the same time, there's an increased demand for um, college education in the labor market. So all the students that are here today, you are in exactly the right place because you're going to be more and more in demand in the coming years as the economy gets more and more complicated. 
Um, all of that is combining to put tremendous pressure on the workforce and tremendous pressure on um, the services that we provide um, to, our, to our students. Um, Notwithstanding the statewide trends, I asked our research folks to show, give me a slide that's this region. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. Um, the blue line here shows us the, um, the growth in the 18 to 24 year old population from 2015 to 2045. Um, this is the uh, county two uh, in the deed regions for folks that um, are familiar with the deed, the way the deed organizes um, data. And what this shows you is that from 2015 to 2025, the rate of high school graduation is going to decline. There'll be fewer high school students coming out of the high school system. And then it, and then it sort of levels off. Um, but counter to the statewide trend, um, from 2015 to 2030, there's a growth in the 18 to 34 year old population. That means people want to come to this part of the state which is great for the economy of this part of the state. And it's, and it's counter to the trend that's happening um, elsewhere in the state. Uh, but you can see even with the increase in the 18 to 24 year old line, the lines are pretty flat. You don't see a big increase in overall population in this region, which means everyone that's here will be more and more valuable to, the, um, to the, your local economy, uh, the more skills that you have to offer. Let me, let me transition from the demographic information and talk a little bit about the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities and the, and the services that we provide. Um, Representative Nornis mentioned affordability. It's a very big deal to our board. It's a core central tenant for us. Uh, and we, we usually start these conversations with um, what we call the red-green slide. And what the red-green slide shows us is all of the providers of higher education in Minnesota, um, what their tuition and fees are on an annual basis. All the green bars represent colleges in our system, the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. All the red bars represent our, our competition, one might say. Um, you'll notice all of our colleges and universities are as far to the left on this slide as you can get. We are the lowest cost provider on a tuition and fee basis in the state. Um, that is a core value for us and one that we um, remain committed to. Uh, if Remember this slide now as I, as I move through a couple of more because it, it, it stands in contrast with some other urban legends that have been moving around. Uh, a couple of, more, um, couple of more data slides here for us and I apologize, I'm sure they're not readable at the, at the fine level, but let me just tell you what the what the colors mean. If you start at the purple line, which is the one that Representative Nornis made reference to, on the top over on the left, what that tells us is that in 2002, the state contributed two thirds of the cost of your education um, to, the, to our operation. And the blue line shows you what you contributed as a student in your tuition. Um, follow that line from 2002 to 2016, and you'll see that they've, they, they spread way far apart, and now they've come back towards each other. In 2016, it's about 52% to 47%. Um, so after the state um, spent many years being a very substantial contributor to the cost of public higher education, that, that moved way away during the state's bad budget years. Um, and it's moved, they've made some progress in the last couple of years, uh, but it's still the case that students pay about half and the taxpayers of Minnesota pay about half. Um, on the bottom of this graphic is a gray line, um, and you can see the gray line just moves kind of around the same spot over these 14 years. Uh, and what this shows us is um, what our revenue has been per student. Um, total revenue per student from 2002 to 2016. It's pretty flat. So when you think about the headlines, about the increase in tuition and the um, criticism of what's going on with tuition, you look at this line and say that, see that it hasn't changed at all. What's happened is the mix has changed. Um, it's no longer two-thirds state, one-third student. It's now about 50-50. 
Uh, and we've worked very hard to keep your, the student cost level during all this very, um, very rocky uh, state investment. Uh, and it's happened in a national context that's, I think, surprising to legislators. Uh, the cuts to Minnesota's investment in public higher education have been deeper than the national average by a substantial portion. Um, it was a 53% decline in state support from fiscal 1999 uh, to fiscal uh, 14, I think this slide ends out. Half, there's been a half, 50% reduction in state support compared to a 29% reduction in, um, on a national average. Deepest cuts in the country. Uh, and that's what we've been struggling with. Um, one of the um, strategies we've used to, um, to, to combat this is to be very, very, very hard on administrative costs. And what this slide shows you is that we are the 38th lowest spender on administration in the country. 38 states spend more than we do on administration at our colleges and universities. Um, this is things like the president's office, the vice presidents, the institutional research people, um, the business office. Uh, so when you hear folks talk about this is all because administration's gotten so fat, um, that's, not a, that's not a correct conclusion. <clears throat> Here's our commitment to you and the, and the commitment we've made um, across, across the state as we talk to folks. Um, we're going to continue to do everything we can. I need to back up. How do I do that? I don't want to push any buttons. Um, we're going to continue to do everything we can to protect the programs that, you, that students care about. Um, on our campuses, across the state, um, to continuously work to serve the needs of students um, in new program development, in offering programs at the times that they want to have them. Um, in every way, do what we can. Go back one, if you can. Um, to, uh, I never touch this stuff. I haven't touched this one either. Okay, that's all right, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, we're also going to work to protect our ability to deliver these programs, um, whether it's through program realignment or uh, making investments in the buildings or working with faculty to develop new programs. And we're gonna remain as committed as we have been and as our board has been um, for 15 years to protect affordability. Um, they have, can you back up one? They have worked hard. Ah, they have worked hard, uh, she found a keyboard I didn't know was here, um, to, uh, to maintain uh, the lowest possible cost of attendance. Um, but we, we do that with the legislature's help. Uh, and that's why I was so delighted uh, that Representative Nornis was able to be here today. He's heard most of this. Um, he's a friend to public higher education. Uh, he's working hard to um, bring resources to us. Uh, but we need the legislature's help to do that. Um, if we're going to be able to protect programs uh, and protect affordability. Um, we arrived at this request to the legislature um, in order to do our best to serve students, all of you and the other 499,000 that we have across Minnesota, um, and the students of tomorrow. Um, I would like, if I might, on behalf of students, to turn to Toya Younger uh, and ask, um, I think Representative Wenzel, with your permission, I'll, I'll stop here and... Uh, Get out of the way so Toya can talk a little bit about um, student services and student success. Thank you very much. Thank you, so much. Thank you, Laura King, for that very, very informative uh, uh, discussion and, and, and speech. Uh, I'm going to, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Toya Younger, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor of Minskew. Dr. Younger has focused her research on higher education opportunity and access, including transfer students, college readiness and preparation, and underserved student populations. Dr. Younger serves on the advisory board for the National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students. Uh, Dr. Younger is also a, has a doctorate in education policy from the University of Michigan and is a native of Flint, Michigan. It's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Toya Younger. Welcome. You know, I have to laugh. He, um, 
I am from Michigan, but I just to correct it, my undergraduate degree is actually from Michigan State. So um, if I'm a little distracted by Final Four conversations or what right now, and and even though I'm here, I'm secretly texting my friends trying to see if I can get tickets to Indianapolis to go to the game. So I am a diehard Spartan through and through. Um, one of the kind of to shift the conversation, a lot of the things that we've been talking about have been state funding and and, and things like that. And, and as a university administrator, as Laura uh, spoke about earlier, my role is a little bit different because the role that I can play with regards to higher ed and financing is improving your time to degree. How many students are in the audience right now? There's a lot of them. And how many you want to get finished with school as quickly as possible? Right back up, exactly. And so that's one of the things that we want to do is make sure that you're taking the right courses. Make sure that you're not spending money taking repeating courses over and over again. Making sure that you have the supports in, in, in place that will help you be successful. There was lots of talk uh, years ago about increasing access to higher education. And that's exactly what Minsk has done. That's exactly what we've seen in higher education, particularly in community and technical colleges. They're open access. They allow uh, opportunities for anyone who's interested in pursuing higher education can show, show up on the doorsteps and we'll, we'll allow you in. And that's wonderful. That, that's one of the things that we need. But we also need to look at the success component. What is it going to take to help you all be successful with, while you're here? And so that's kind of what my, my work focuses on is what we can do to support the students while you're here to make sure not only that you have a wonderful educational opportunity, but that you advance and that you progress towards whatever your educational goals may be, be it getting some sort of uh, certificate or uh, getting an associate degree from here and then transferring to a four-year institution or whatnot, whatever your educational goals are, it's our job, it's my job to make sure that you have those seamless transitions in place and that you have the support networks in place as well. So how do we do this? Well, we can start by creating conditions for success. And, and what do we know, and, and I have to kind of give a caveat, I'm a researcher by trade, and so I always look to see what the research says about college students, and then figuring out whether or not how I can apply this to the work that I'm doing with current students. And so right now, when we're looking at the research, it says that we need to examine conditions that foster student <laughs> learning on campus. What is it that we can do on our individual campuses to make sure that you guys are learning the best, that you have the support networks, that if by chance you weren't, didn't receive a, or a, didn't have all the skills that you needed when you graduated from high school, what can we do once you step foot on this campus or step foot on a college campus to make sure that you're brought back up to speed to where you need to be and that you're uh, able to learn effectively? Next, it talks about addressing factors that impact the success of first generation, low income, and or students of color. And Laura alluded to this earlier. How many people in the audience are first generation college students? Exactly, a lot of people, if you're the first person in your family to go away to college. And so there are certain things that you will experience that other people may not. People whose parents or grandparents or what not have already ex had a collegiate experience, they can kind of share with them a little bit more information than you might necessarily have. So there are certain factors and things that we have to address. Um, in addition to low income students, there are a lot of financial barriers and things that we need to address as well, recognizing that people have different financial challenges now. Uh, back when I was in school, you know, my parents could say, hey, Toya, we want you to go to school full time and we don't want you to work. We want you to focus on your studies. That has changed significantly, and I'm not that old, to be quite honest. But <laughs> that has changed. There are a lot of times we have, we have seen the number of students who are working full time and going to school part time. How many of you guys are working and going to school simultaneously? Exactly. There's a lot of folks who recognize that they have to uh, provide not only for their family, but also manage to try and pay this tuition at the same time. And then also there's a lot of uh, factors that impact students of color. Uh, I'll be honest, I moved here from uh, the Washington, D.C. area, and it, they kind of have this little joke they call D.C. Chocolate City because there's a lot, large population of African Americans who live in the D.C. area proper. And so here I am, a little black girl from Flint, Michigan, li leaving a segregated Michigan area, to be quite honest, moving to D.C., which is extremely diverse in terms of uh, age and race and religion and ethnicity, just us huge kind of the melting pot of America, if you will. And after being there for 20 years, I moved to Minnesota. <laughs> 
and needless to say, and I'm not a student, uh, but needless to say, there are just some, some, some cultural differences and changes that, that you experience being a person of color in, in, in a different environment. And so we have to think about that and be cognizant of that when we're dealing with our students of color on our campuses as well. So those are some other factors that we as administrators need to address. And then lastly, we have to make sure that we're providing the services that I mentioned before, specific services to make sure that you students can be successful on your campuses. So let's look briefly at some of the conditions that foster learning. Well, the research tells us that small, institutes, small institutional size and small class sizes tend to work better for people. If you're in a class with 20 people, you're more likely to have some one-on-one -on -one interaction with your faculty member. You can ask them questions more readily and, and go up to them afterwards and say, hey, I'm John and I have a question about what you did. And so we see that small class sizes tend to help. And, and Laura alluded to this earlier too, as she talked, showed you on the map how many campuses uh, and, and how many institutions fall within the Minsky system. Because we do have campuses all over the place and all throughout the state, we do have some campuses that are smaller and that are more conducive to students who learn in smaller campuses. Some students may not enjoy going to a large 20-some thousand campus, you know, community college campus. They may feel like they're getting lost in the number, but if you are attending a smaller campus with smaller class sizes, that might be more conducive to your learning style. Additionally, um, we find that when faculty have an emphasis on teaching and learning as opposed to research, the students tend to do better. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about community colleges is that the faculty members here, and I, and I, I can speak as if I know your faculty because I know Larry, but the faculty members here genuinely are concerned about the students and they put their focus and their emphasis on teaching and making sure you're successful. When you look at some of the larger universities and even at some of your research one universities, the faculty there tend to be focused on their own personal research agenda. And so they don't necessarily put the same time and effort and commitment into some of the work that you're, they're doing in the classroom. And so one of the things that we know contributes to student success is having a faculty who genuinely can care about their students. Additionally, comprehensive retention efforts, and I talked about this earlier, is it's one thing to make sure that you all get admitted and you have access to higher ed, but it's our responsibility to make sure that we have success programs in place and retention efforts in place to keep you here so that you can get the knowledge and skills that you need and then to also help you transfer out or do whatever your uh, next steps or educational goals may be. Financial support, and, and I kind of talked about this earlier, but there's also um, a need to think not only about financial support in terms of financial aid and the state grants, but there's other financial supports that really uh, we've seen an increase in the needs of students. And some of that financial support may be uh, instances of assistance with child care. Uh, some of our campuses have food banks on campus. Some of them have uh, help with housing and, and residential services. And so these ty other types of financial support can also help students become uh, more, not only more connected to their campus, but also a system in the learning process. Engagement and connections with mentors. And there's uh, how many faculty members or uh, staff administrators are in the audience today? Great, and, and th that's who you're connecting with. Those folks who raise their hands, those people who are here who are committed to helping you. Sometimes your connection or, or the person that you connect with on campus is not necessarily a faculty member. Sometimes it's the administrative assistant who gives you the basketball when you're checking into the rec center. Sometimes it's the, the, the janitor who's cleaning up and you, you lost your iPhone in the class and he found it for you and he brings it to you and he helps you and says, hey, good job, you know, keep up the good work, something like that. But there's something about the connection with individuals on a campus that also helps breed success for our students. And that's one of the things that we're really committed to is making sure that we're hiring the best staff, faculty, and administrators to provide you all with those types of supports. And then lastly, peer connections. How many people here are in the same class? Or you play basketball together? Or you're in student government together? You, now, come on, you guys know each other because you're over there messing with each other. I see you in the back. <laughs> but there's something about the connections that you make at college that, that also assist in the learning process. A lot of times people think, well, you know, sometimes students who are at community colleges, they're just kind of coming in quickly and they just want to take their classes, get their credits and leave. And that's not always the case. There's something about being connected. And, and that's why I, I, we had a great time taking a tour of this campus not only learning about the different um, academic 
academic programs that are offered here, but learning about the sports teams and all the different uh, variety of clubs and organizations that take place on campus. All of that too contributes to your experience here on the college campus and all of those things contribute to student success. So I'm gonna just briefly kind of, if for the sake of time, go through some of the factors that we mentioned talking about impacting uh, diverse student populations. One, as I mentioned, is that first generation college student who may not always know the answers of where should I go or who, should I, who, who do I go to when I help or I'm flunking a class and I need to drop it but I don't know anything about it or I don't know who I should see. Number two, the socialization into the culture of the academy and, and folks who are really engrossed in higher ed, it really is a culture. And if you're not familiar with it, you can easily get lost. And, you know, there's, they start dropping all these terms and deadlines and midterms and drop ads and FAFSA and all this kind of stuff. And it sounds like a completely different language to folks who, aren't, who have not had a higher ed experience. And so it's important that we recognize that the students who are coming into our classrooms and who are showing up on our campuses may not always have the background or the knowledge. And so we have to provide that information for them in order to help them be successful. Connections to the external community. I think it's absolutely awesome that uh, community members, mayors, su school superintendents, all these people are here because it takes a village. It truly does. It's a, it's a commitment from uh, K, it's not even K through 12 anymore. We kind of look at it from K through 20 all the way through. It's partnerships. I was talking to a couple of students here today just as I was walking around. They said, oh, by the way, yeah, I took courses in high school. I was a PSCO student. It's those kind of partnerships and connections that are so important connections that the campus community has to the external community and they tend to play a significant role in the students lives and lastly of course economic pressures and fa and uh, family demands and we spoke about this earlier is that there are now students who are not only taking care of their children but they have to provide support be it financial support medical support or whatnot for their parents so they're kind of caught in the in between stages and so we have to recognize too that our students may not be 100 percent solely focused on school that they have competing interest and competing things happening outside of the classroom and so it's our job to provide that support for them while they're going through that and so lastly, I just wanted to cover some of the specific student success initiatives that are taking place at some of our Minsku campuses. Uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, there are lots of programs and services that we need to provide, but also a lot of these services tend to cost money. And so we're learning how to do more with less, uh, but these are things that are critical for your success as students. And so certain things such as summer bridge programs, mandatory orientations for new students, first year experience programs, those are things that kind of help students transition. Okay, you've been, you've decided that you want to go to campus. Here, here are some things that we're going to do to kind of tell you about our community, to kind of teach you about what it means to go to college and what things you need to know. Then we also move into um, some support services, academic support services. So you're looking at supplemental instruction, uh, professional advisors who sit down and tell you, okay, you need to take this course, or after you take this, this is the next sequence or whatnot. We're also looking at a variety of uh, not, on, not only technological services, but also um, working with our counselors to do some early alerts and uh, intrusive advising. You know, at some of the smaller schools that I know, you know, if you don't show up for a class, the faculty member will call you up and say, hey, where have you been? What's going on? And so while we may not be able to do that, but with the help of technology and whatnot, we can see, you know, how many people have been regularly attending class or, hey, there's some students who haven't been doing well and it's the midterm. And if they don't get straight A's for the rest of the semester, they're going to fail this class. So maybe we need to call them in and kind of have an intervention and figure out what's going on with those students. So those early alert, alert systems and intrusive advising can really pay off in the long run because you end up not getting stuck repeating courses over and over again and having to pay for them over and over again. And then the last group of um, initiatives that we really focus on are what kind of your what next. We provide academic support in writing and mathematics and whatnot, but we're also looking to improve uh, transfer pathways. That's one of the things that I'm really passionate about is making sure that students, particularly students at community colleges, have a seamless transition. Those who are interested in pursuing four-year degrees have a seamless transition and make sure that they're on the right track academically, taking the right courses that they need at the right time that will not only help them 
uh, achieve their associate's degree if that is in fact their desire, but that those classes are transferable specifically into whatever major they choose. And I think that that's what's really important. We're seeing a lot of work, particularly in the state legislature right now, that revolves around transfer. Many students are starting off at community colleges first. It's the most economical decision for them. And then they're trying to transfer, but they're having some, some bumps along the way. And so that's one of the things that we're really trying to work on, um, particularly within the Minsk U system, is making sure that we're working with our students in an effort to help them have a seamless transition, ultimately, to improve that time to degree, which is kind of what I started talking about earlier. It's so important. We see people, as uh, Chairman Nornis mentioned, the student who you know, had all these loans and it was because she was taking courses over and over again and, and accruing debt and, and the loans kept adding up and adding up. And so one of the things that we're committed to doing is making sure that you're on the right pathway academically, that you have a wonderful college experience and that whatever that transition may be for you, if it's job placement, if it's transferring to a four-year institution, that we provide the support mechanisms in an effort to do that. So um, now at this time, I guess we would open it up for questions. I'm not quite sure how... You all want to monitor, facilitate that? <laughs> 